So before anything else, let me introduce to the topical workbook for computer science 2210-0478. This is the workbook one for, for paper one, basically computer systems. And as you can see from the table of contents, I've included questions on each and every subtopic from the syllabus along with the mark scheme. And these are some of the actual questions, actual pages uh, as a preview from the workbook section 1.1, 1.3, 2.2, 3.2, 2, 5.3 cyber security and artificial intelligence. This is just to show you a glimpse of what type of questions are included in the workbook. There are many 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 more questions where these come from and around 18 to 20 questions on an average are included for each and every topic. A must buy if you want to boost your grade. Similar to the paper one workbook, I have designed a paper workbook for paper two as well. This is for algorithm programming and logic uh, for CIEs either 2210 or 0478 GCE or IGCSE computer science. As you can see, it contains questions on every subsection of the syllabus content for paper two along with the mark scheme so you can understand each and every question each and every um, algorithm these are some of the few pages from the workbook just to give you a glimpse of what type of questions are included as you can see this is 7.1 this is 7.7 8.3 and section 10 boolean logic so um, a lot more questions are included in the workbook a must buy if you want to have a very good score in your Cambridge examination order now assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh welcome back to my channel and as you guys know I have uploaded lectures on each and every topic of uh, computer science and as promised uh, now I am going to start uploading lectures of uh, physics like I said I'll be uploading uh, other subjects lectures on my channel as well so here we are let's start discussing physics 5054 or if you are an IGCSE student then uh, your code would be 0625 if I'm not wrong <coughs> so uh, we are going to start our discussion on section 1 of the physics syllabus motion forces and energy now keep in mind this is the longest section of the physics syllabus so uh, the lectures are going to be long now I'll try to make them as simple as possible and hopefully a bit entertaining but well it's physics so we are today we are going to discuss section 1.1 measurement of physical quantities or in syllabus it's simply written as measurement and physical quantities anyways so <coughs> before we actually dive into the contents of the syllabus what you need to know is that what is a unit a unit is a standard that you used for making comparisons in measurements you always need to have a unit with your measurement you cannot take a measurement without units and uh, you have to use the appropriate unit uh, before taking any measurements you have to choose an appropriate unit like let's suppose if you are describing the distance between two points and you simply write it as 100 then obviously it would be very confusing 100 watt you have to tell some unit of measurement along with it you need some unit of length along with it 100 centimeters 100 meters 100 kilometers or something like that Measurements can be taken by either basic quantities or derived quantities. Well, mostly basic quantities. And uh, the system of units that we use is known, more commonly is known as the SI unit system or the system international US, um, unit system. It is also known as metric system and uh, whereas uh, most of the countries in today's world use the SI or the metric system whereas US is probably the only country which use the English or the imperial units for measurement now in the SI system we have some base quantities and uh, others are supposed to be derived quantities 
these seven are the base quantities length mass time electric current temperature amount of substance and luminous intensity now as you can see all of these measure some physical aspect of something now the units that we use and their symbol are supposed to be for length we use meter and the symbol for that is a, a small m like this this is a little typing mistake mass for mass we use kilograms and the symbol for that is kg again in written in small time we use seconds s for electric current we use ampere the symbol is a for temperature we use kelvin and the symbol is capital k the amount of substance we use mole and the symbol is mol for luminous intensity we use candela and the symbol is cd now let's go through a little description of these quantities and where uh, applicable their units now the length is supposed to be the distance between two points or in standard physics nowadays the definite the length is defined as the distance light travels in a vacuum in a 1 divided by 2997929458 of a second is known as length in this amount of time like if you divide a second by 2997929458 in that time the amount of distance that is traveled by a beam of light is known as one meter length can be measured using meter rule or tape measure and accuracy of both of these is 0.1 centimeter always remember in physics you often have to show the precision or the accuracy of the reading or the measurement that you take and for that you need to know what is the accuracy of the instrument that you're using to record that measurement your ans answer is only as accurate as the instrument you are using for mass we, uh, what is mass mass is amount of matter in a particle or an object um, again this is the simple or the layman definition whereas uh, as per the standards of physics nowadays we define mass as the amount of matter in a platinum iridium cylinder that is housed at the International Bureau of Weights and Measurers near Paris and all the other 1 kg masses around the world are said to be an exact replica of that sample. It can be measured using a beam balance or an electronic balance. Beam balance has an accuracy of 0.05 grams and electronic balance has an accuracy of 0.001 grams. Next we have time and uh, time is defined as the continued sequence of existence whereas the unit for time is supposed to be seconds and uh, what is second? A second is the time required for 919263177 vibrations occurring in a cesium 133 atom. It can be measured using stopwatch or a stop clock and both of them can either be manual or analog. Accuracy of an analog stopwatch is 0.2 seconds and for digital it is supposed to be 0.005 seconds. Where I, uh, keep in mind whenever we are recording time then we consider the human reaction error or human reaction time as well the amount of time that takes the human brain to get an, a visual input through eyes and then send a signal to the nervous through the nervous system so that some action can be performed and that time is generally between 0.2 seconds to 0.9 seconds whereas for the sake of physics paper you simply uh, utilize whatever reaction time is given in the question by the examiner next is current the flow of electrons in a circuit and it can be measured using an ammeter or a multimeter again both of them can either be analog or digital accuracy of an analog one is 3% whereas digital uh, one is accurate up to 0.05% temperature the measure of average kinetic energy of particles in an object it is measured using the thermometer now the most of the lab or 
or medical thermometers that we use are uh, marked in degree centigrade so the accuracy of it is uh, supposed to be 0 0.5 degree celsius whereas uh, if you are using a thermometer that is marked with kelvin scale or fahrenheit scale then you simply write it as 0 0.5 kelvin or 0 0.5 uh, fahrenheit amount of substance it means that how many atoms, ions or molecules are present in a sa sample when compared to a similar sample of carbon-12 atom. This is a quantity which cannot be calculated physically as atoms are very small so we go for a formula approach instead and we use mathematical formulas to get the, the number of moles of an object. Then we have luminous intensity, the amount of light that a source produces in a given direction. Again, this cannot be measured directly and is rather calculated through a formula that is uh, a bit beyond the scope of your syllabus. These were the base quantities. The next are the derived quantities. What are the derived quantities? These are quantities which are simply obtained by multiplying or dividing one or more base quantities like if you multiply <coughs> length into my with another length and another length like if you multiplied the three sides uh, the length of three sides of an object you get its volume if uh, similarly we have density similarly we have force we have acceleration and we have many more quantities which are um, which are derived because they are calculated mathematically um, by using one or more base quantities using prefixes and standard notation now when we are talking about measurements then often the measurements are too big or too small we cannot simply write them like this if you have this number 1 million grams then instead of writing it as 1 million grams you need to have a way that uh, you can define it in a more precise a more a standard form for that we use uh, prefixes with our units 10 raised to power minus 9 is supposed to be nano the symbol is a small n 10 raised to power minus 6 is supposed to be micro 10 raised to power minus 3 is milli 10 raised to power minus 2 is centi 10 raised to power minus 1 is deci 10 raised to power 3 is kilo 10 raised to power 6 is mega 10 raised to power 9 is giga and 10 raised to power 12 is supposed to be tera so instead of writing it like this i can simply write it as one and one two three four five six there are six zeros so i can that means 10 raised to power six and that is supposed to be mega so I can simply write as as this this would be read as 1 mega gram this M is a prefix for this unit that is gram next you need to express often you need to express your answer in the standard notations what are a standard no notations standard notation means that a number is expressed in form of a multiplied by 10 raised to power b where a is a number between 1 to 9 and b can be any positive or negative integer uh, b is basically the power of 10 that is required so that the uh, uh, standard form is mathematically equivalent to the original number now how do you calculate how to convert a number into standard form what you need to do is whenever you are given a number you simply need to move the decimal point in your number until there is only one non-zero digit to the left of the decimal point the resulting decimal number is a count how many places you move the decimal point that number is supposed to be B and if you move the decimal to the left side then B is positive and if you had to move the decimal on the right side then B is negative whereas if you did not need it to move <coughs> your decimal point at all then B is supposed to be 0 
write your scientific uh, specific notation number as a multiplied by 10 raised to power b and read it as a times 10 to the power of b and uh, remember to remove the trailing zeros only if they were to the left of the decimal point now let's solve an example for example uh, you have this number 4143004 and you have to convert it into standard form now you need uh, now over here there is no decimal that means the decimal is over here now we need to move the decimal so that there is only one number on the left side of the decimal right now there are one two three four five six seven numbers so me we move would move the decimal from here to here 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 and here and we would get 4.143004 and we needed to jump six numbers so we move the decimal pl six places to the left so our a would be this 4.143004 and uh, since we gave the decimal six shifts so we would say that b is supposed to be six now we simply have to plug them into their places and the number 4143004 converted to standard form would be written as 4.143004 <coughs> times 10 raised to power 6 or 4 into 10 raised to power 6 let's see another example for example you have this number you have this number now if you need to convert it into standard form what you need to do is you need to move this decimal point so that it comes on the left side of your first non-zero character so one two and three I'll need to make this decimal point move three places now I can eliminate these zeros and my a would be four whereas my b would be three because I needed to make it shift three times so I would write my answer as four into ten raised to power minus three because I needed to shift my decimal point on the right side okay next we need to discuss uh, some, some measuring techniques measuring using standard devices or standard instruments the first uh, thing you need to know is how to measure lens and for that the first instrument we have is a meter rule the object to be measured is placed next to the meter rule or the tape measure the zero mark on the tape measure or meter rule should align with the start of the object like you can see over here this is the start of the the eraser of the pencil and the zero mark aligns perfectly with it and the length reading is taken if you have something that is longer than a meter we use tape measure if you have some irregular object like a cylinder or um, <coughs> like a curved surface for that also we use tape measure if you have to take a measurement that is uh, longer than a few meters we use a trundle wheel a trundle wheel is this device and it can uh, measure longer distances than a meter rule or a tape measure when we talk about taking measurements then uh, you need to remember one thing that your answer should always include uncertainties or errors that may be a part of your reading now always remember that your readings are always only as accurate as the device or the instrument that you are using if you remember correctly when uh, if you remember when we were discussing these <coughs> then I told you the accuracy of all the instruments because you need to remember this and you need to incorporate it into your answer when taking measurements now there are two types of errors that can occur while taking a measurement one is supposed to be a systematic error uh, where measured quantities are 
displaced from the true value by a fixed magnitude and in the same direction like no matter how many readings you take from that instrument all of those readings would have the same error there are two examples of that one is known as zero error and the other one is known as parallax error and systematic errors can be avoided by checking for zero error before taking readings and plotting a graph and if the graph does not cut the expected intercept then we say that the shift was due to a systematic error then we have random errors which are errors of measurement in which the measured quantities differ from <coughs> <coughs> average value means every time you take take the reading it has some different level or percentage of error sources of random errors are they may be ar ar arisen from parallax error if you are viewing your scale from different angles instead of viewing it from the same angle and uh, uh, some variation in environmental conditions irregularity ir irregularity of the quantity being measured limitations of the equipment um, such as your equipment may be too much sensitive for your experiment in that case it the reading would keep on fluctuating and it would be difficult for you to pinpoint a single reading ways to reduce random error take repeated readings and plot a graph <coughs> or obtain an average value take multiple readings plot a graph in form of line or curve of the best fit maintain good experimental techniques like read from a correct position and uh, do not use too accurate or too much sensitive equipment then uh, we have a parallax error like we discussed we have uh, two types of systematic error parallax error and um zero error so what is a parallax error uh, parallax error occurs when you do not look at your scale at a right angle when you are looking at your scale no matter what instrument you are using your eye should be perpendicular to the scale like this this is supposed to be the correct reading whereas if you see it from different angles then your answer may be smaller than the actual value or greater than the actual value so always avoid parallax error the next instrument we use to measure length is supposed to be vernier caliper vernier caliper is in an instrument that looks something like this it has jaws it has a moving scale that is known as vernier scale and it has a long fixed scale that is known as the main scale now the main scale can be of 15 cm or 25 cm but often in cambridge we uh, stuck with we are stuck with the 15 cm vernier caliper so you can say that for measuring objects that are up to 15 cm in length we can use a vernier caliper and it is accurate to 0 0.01 cm or it is precise up to two decimal places now how to take readings from a vernier caliper you basically put the object between the jaws over here using this uh, screw we move this vernier scale we open these jaws and we put the thing which we want to measure inside and then we tighten the jaws around that object and then we take two readings from the vernier caliper one is on the main scale and the other one is from the vernier scale and by adding the two readings together we finally get the actual length of the object that is in between the jaws how do we do that for taking the reading on the main scale we check which mark on the main, main scale is to the immediate left of or aligns perfectly with the zero mark on the vernier scale that is our main scale reading and uh, then we take our vernier scale reading by checking which line of vernier scale perfectly aligns with the uh, any of the marking on the main scale J always remember each mark on vernier scale is of 0 0.01 centimeter and we find the final reading by adding these two values for example if you're given this picture and you're asked to deduce the reading then first of all i'm going to check the reading of the main scale 
and uh, for that the formula is simple I'll simply have to see that where is the zero mark on the vernier scale it is over there now the marking of main scale on the immediate left of this zero is supposed to be my main scale reading which in this case is 10 centimeter then I'll check which mark of vernier scale collides perfectly aligns perfectly with any of the marking on main scale so over here the first line does not aligns but the second line does so that means this is my mark each line is of 0 0.01 centimeter so 1 and 2 this is the second line or the second mark so I would say my vernier reading is 0 0.02 centimeter now by adding these two together 10.02 centimeter would be my answer and if I uh, want to show it write it in a very precise and accurate way I would write it like this I would write it like this 10.02 plus minus 0.01 centimeter means my reading comes out to be 10.02 centimeter but there can be an error or inaccuracy or uncertainty of 0.01 centimeter like the actual answer may be 10.01 or 10.03 next uh, when we are talking about vernier caliper then zero error is a very important um, topic you need to know how to what is a zero error and how to find it now zero error we say that a vernier caliper has zero error if in the closed state like uh, if you close these jaws together if in the closed state if the zero of the main scale does not perfectly aligns with the zero of vernier scale then the caliper is said to have a zero error there are two types of zero error positive zero error and negative zero error if the zero of the vernier scale is on the right side of the main scale this is the main scale zero this is the vernier scale zero and you can see this zero of the vernier scale is on the right side of the main scale in this situation we say that this vernier caliper has a positive zero error and uh, to find the value of the zero error that by how much <coughs> degrees sorry not degrees by what is the magnitude of this zero error we simply see which line of vernier scale aligns perfectly with the main scale not the first line not the second not the third but the fourth one aligns perfectly so we would say this vernier caliper has a positive zero error of 0 0.04 centimeter if you remember each line on vernier scale is of 0 0.01 centimeters positive error is always subtracted from the reading to find the actual reading for example if you're given that a vernier scale has measured an object at 3.34 centimeter and this is the zero error in that uh, vernier caliper then what would be the actual reading you simply minus these two together 3.34 minus your error that is 0 0.04 and that means your actual answer would be 3.3 centimeters plus minus 0 0.01 centimeter this is done just to show the precision and if your then we have a negative zero error when the zero of the vernier scale is on the left side of the main scale in the closed state we say that it ha the caliper has negative zero error negative zero error is always added to the taken reading in order to find the actual reading for example if we have 3.34 <coughs> as our reading and zero error is minus 0 0.04 then we simply add these two together 3.34 plus 0 0.04 is 3.38 now you would say if the error is given in minus why are we plusing it so the formula is simple in order to find the error you have to use this formula reading minus error now your reading is 3.34 in terms of a positive zero error you you would have an equation like this this would turn out to be 3.34 minus 0. 0 0.04 because plus minus is minus but in terms of a negative zero error 3.34 minus 
minus 0 0.04 this would become 3.34 plus 0 0.04 because minus and minus becomes a plus this is that is why negative zero error is always added to the given reading in order to find the actual reading and here we have our this is our answer next instrument that we have is supposed to be a micrometer screw gauge it is made up of a main scale and a thimble scale thimble scale is this it is a circular scale whereas main scale is printed as a horizontal scale on this micrometer a micrometer can only measure the objects up to 5 cm in length the smallest marking is usually 1 mm on the main scale and that is also known as a sleeve and 0.01 mm on the thimble scale or the rotating scale so a thimble scale has total of 50 markings representing 0.5 millimeter so the accuracy for a micrometer screw gauge is supposed to be 0.01 millimeters how to use this spend this spindle is first closed on the anvil this is the anvil so this is this spindle is closed by rotating this and we check for the zero error okay we will talk about zero error uh, later first let's see how the readings are taken the spindle is then open to fit the object firmly in between the spindle and the anvil and then the reading is taken we follow the same rules first we take the reading of the main scale and then we take the reading of the uh, rotating or the thimble scale and then we add them together to find the actual reading for example if you are given this diagram then simply count what is the reading for the main scale this is as if you remember correctly each marking on the main scale is one millimeter so that means this is zero this is one millimeter this is two millimeter on the downside of the main scale there is always a marking for half millimeter means this is zero this is 0 0.5 this is one this is 1.5 this is two and this is 2.5 if you can see over here let me try to zoom in a little as you can see there is a small marking which is visible that means the reading of main scale is supposed to be 2.5 millimeters next we would see this is the zero line or the uh, main line of main scale next we need to see that which marking on the rotating scale or the thimble scale aligns with the zero line of the main scale so in this case it is 35 36 37 and 38 if you remember correctly thimble scale each marking on thimble scale is supposed to be of 0 0.01 millimeter so that means this is 0 0.38 millimeters on the thimble scale now just add them together 2.5 plus 0 0.38 millimeter would give you 2.88 millimeters plus minus 0 0.01 millimeter again we have zero errors in uh, micrometers as well in the closed state if the zero of thimble scale is below the zero line it is known as positive zero error whereas if the zero of main scale is above the zero line it is known as a negative uh, zero error like over here if you can see this zero is below the zero line or the main line on the main scale so we would say that it has a positive zero error now what is the magnitude of this zero error simply count which line con aligns with the um, zero mark or the z main line on the main scale that is mm, over here it is the fifth mark so that means this screw gauge has a zero error of 0 0.05 millimeter and if it is above the zero line then it is said to be a negative zero error in the case of a negative zero error we count downwards so this line is a 1 and 2 
वन एंड टू टू पॉइंट बिलो दिस द जीरो मार्क ऑन द थिम्बल स्केल इज टू पॉइंट अब द जीरो लाइन ऑन मेन स्केल सो वी वुड से दैट दिस स्क्रू गॉज हैज अ जीरो एरर अ नेगेटिव जीरो एरर ऑफ जीरो पॉइंट जीरो टू मिलीमीटर एंड जस्ट लाइक द वर्नियर कैलिपर पॉजिटिव जीरो एरर इज सब्रैक्टेड फ्रॉम द रीडिंग वेर एज नेगेटिव जीरो एरर इज एडेड ऑन टू आर रीडिंग नेक्स्ट वी हैव द मेजरमेंट ऑफ वॉल्यूम and volume of an ob object can be found using the displacement method in a and by by using a measuring cylinder how do we do that we basically fill a measuring cylinder with some liquid most oftenly water and then we take the initial reading that how much water or liquid is inside the measuring cylinder like this now remember when taking the measurement you have to keep your eye at a perpendicular level and you have to measure the lower minuscule the water in a measuring cylinder or a burette is always in a slightly concave form you do not have to take the reading of the tip you have to take the reading of the lowest point of the concave this is known as the lower minuscule and you have to take the reading of over there like over here this is supposed to be 60 61 2 if you write it as 68 this would be wrong reading so do not take the reading of upper minuscule always take the reading from the lower minuscule or the bottom minuscule and then you place that object inside the water or your liquid the water or liquid is going to rise because of the object take the new reading that would be your final reading by subtracting the two readings together you would get to know the volume of the the object like uh, over here this is a measuring cylinder and as you can see right now the water is at 150th cm mark now we put the stone inside now the water has risen to 160 170 180 cm mark that means the volume of this stone is 30 cm cube 180 minus 150 would give you 30 cm cube measuring time in such type of questions you would always be given two stop watches two analog uh, watches stop watches or two digital clocks and you would be required to find how much time was uh, taken for a certain task like a race or anything else so first of all you have to take the initial time reading at the start of the lap this is 55.10 seconds and then you have to take the reading at the end of the race or at the end of the reaction or at the end of the task and that is 1 minute and 45 seconds point 10 seconds to be exact now time taken for the task is calculated by minusing these two values together by minusing the uh, initial value from the final reading so over but our final value is in minutes whereas our initial value is in seconds so first of all we have to convert them into equal measurement units so we'll convert these this reading which is in minutes into a reading in seconds 1 hour 1 minute means 60 seconds and uh, plus 45.10 seconds would give you 105.10 seconds now we have the same units for our, both our readings we can minus them 105.10 minus 55.10 would give us 50 seconds so we would state that this journey this lap or this uh, occurrence took 50 seconds and this is how we measure time the examiner often gives you a task where you have to find the reading of something very small that it is 
almost impossible to take a single measurement. In such a case, what we do is we stack or pack together multiple objects so that they are thick enough for some measurement to be taken and then we divide it by the number of uh, objects that we used, number of identical objects and we find the uh, width or the length of a single object. For example, if you are asked to find the width of a sheet, single sheet of paper and you, you only have a, major, a meter rule, it is virtually impossible. So what we do is we <coughs> take a stack of papers 10, 100, 50, 25 or whatever is given in the question. We take the measurement of the width of that stack of paper and then we divide it by the number of papers in that stack. For example, if this if a stack is of 100 sheets and the uh, measurement of it is 20, uh, the thickness of it is 25 millimeters, simply divide 23 by 100 and you would know that a single sheet of paper is supposed to be 0 0.23 millimeter thick. Similarly, if you have to uh, measure the time for a uh, one swing of pendulum, it is next to impossible. One swing is like this one, not from here till here, but you'll take the pendulum, you'll move, uh, um, you'll uh, retract it and you'll drop it from over here it will go from there to here and when it comes back to its starting position that would be counted as one complete swing only from here till here would be counted as half a swing so what we do is when we drop a pendulum it comes back so fast that it is virtually impossible to stop your stopwatch in time you have to um, keep in mind that human reaction time is there as well and for very small values of time human reaction time uh, means there is a very big percentage of error in your answer so what we do is we take 10 or 20 swings the time for 10 or 20 swings and then we divide it by the number of swings like for example if you have taken time for 10 swings and you got the time as 15 seconds simply divide 15 by uh, 10 that is the number of times of swings and you would get 1.5 seconds for a single swing now from if you remember human reaction time is 0 0.2 seconds 1.5 minus 0 0.2 would mean a one point uh, there is a big error 0 point zero point two divided by one point five into hundred means your answer would be having an uncertainty of around or error of around uh, thirteen percent that is a very big amount that is why we follow this method we take multiple readings for multiple readings we got fifteen seconds now the error is supposed to be zero point two seconds see in this reading there is only 1.3 percent error this is why we take the time for multiple swings and then we divide it by the number of swing in order to reduce the error or uncertainty in our answer another example is finding diameter of a single ball like uh, the examiner has stacked over here four balls and then it has given you a scale as you can see the actual a width of the ball start at the fourth mark and ends at the twelfth mark so that means the actual length of four balls is supposed to be 12 minus 4 8 centi this is centimeters 8 centimeters now how do you find the uh, length of a single ball simply divide by the number of balls 8 divided by 4 is supposed to be 2 centimeter and that would be the diameter of a single ball do not uh, start counting from over here as from 1 till 4 is a wooden block and you do not need to consider it in your calculation. Now uh, next you need to know what is scalar and what is vector. Scalar quantities are quantities in which the magnitude is stated but the direction is either not applicable or not specified or it is basically not needed. Scalar quantities only have a sing value and that's it they do not they are not specified to a direction but uh, for example distance 
speed, time, mass, energy, and temperature. Whereas vector quantities has both has both a scalar, uh, a magnitude, and a direction. They both must be present for quantity to be labeled as vector. And the examples of vector quantities are displacement, force, weight, velocity, acceleration, momentum, electric field strength, and gravitational field strength. The last topic of this section is supposed to be addition of vectors at right angle. A vector can be represented by a straight line with an arrowhead showing its direction. The length of the line represents the magnitude of the vector. Now if you have to add two vectors which are perpendicular to each other we can use two methods either we can solve it mathematically by using trigonometric functions uh, precisely the law of tangent and the Pythagoras theorem whereas uh, the second object is by using the graphical addition you know, or the parallelogram rule or by using the head to tail rule. The formula for calculating the magnitude of the vac resultant vector is supposed to be under f x square plus f y square under root. And for finding the angle or the direction, we use tan theta equals to f y upon f x. f x is supposed to be your the base of your right angle triangle, whereas f y is supposed to be the perpendicular. Here is the solved example. Let's suppose a hiker walks 11 kilometers due north from camp and then turns and walks 11 kilometers due east. What is the total distance walked by the hiker? The total distance is 11 kilometers plus 11 kilometers equals to 22 kilometers because over here the distance is a scalar quantity. We do not need to consider the um, direction. What is the displacement? on a straight line of the hiker from the camp. Now displacement is a vector quantity so we need to find the magnitude as well as the uh, direction or the angle. So we apply the formula uh, both x and y base and height are 11 so we put them under root and we get under root 121 plus 121 that is under root 242 and the answer would be 15.56 kilometers. Whereas for finding the direction, we would apply tan theta equals to f y upon f x, that is tan theta equals to 11 upon 11. And then for finding theta, we ap uh, apply the inverse of tangent and we get 45 degrees. So we would say that magnitude of resultant vector is 15.56 kilometers at 45 degrees to f x, means the base of the triangle. And if you have to solve it, uh, in form of a graph what you need to do is plot both of them means fx and fy or base and height at right angle with proper scale for example one centimeter equals to one kilometers so make a one straight line one uh, vertical line along the y-axis of 11 centimeters and then on uh, the and then you can make another line that is uh, uh, you can make another line of uh, at uh, something like uh, on the ac along the x-axis or again of 11 kilometers now as you can see the mm, before the the image you were just saying that was uh, kind of upside down so this is the first vector that the a hiker walked 11 kilometers due north so this is due north and then he walked due east so this is due east and uh, we would take uh, one centimeter equals to one kilometer so this would be of 11 uh, centimeter and then this would be of 11 centimeter now how would uh, how did I knew that where to put the arrowhead simply the hiker was walking due north so that means he was walking from here towards the direction of the north so arrowhead would show that direction and after walking 11 kilometers he turned right or towards the east so I drew, I drew my arrowhead in that direction for the second vector now for finding 
um, the resultant factor what I simply need to do is I can I um I can simply connect these two vectors together by using lines from here till here and then from here till here the diagonal from the point where my first two vectors meet till the end of this parallelogram or till the end of this square this has turned into a square because both of my sides are equal otherwise it would be mostly a parallelogram this is supposed to be my resultant vector and I can use a scale to measure its magnitude and a protector placed over here to measure its along the base to measure its uh, angle with respect to the base or the f y of my um, vectors okay so i hope you have understood these physical quantities and their measurement if you have any problem feel free to uh, comment below and please uh, please do give your comments i would like to know your feedback about uh, how you felt this lecture was i'll see you guys in the next lecture take care allah hafiz